our speaker is uh, is Greg, and he's on. He's going to be here shortly, but uh, he's in tra in traffic because there was an accident. So um, he said that since he's not here, that uh, we could do prayers, and by the time we're com our prayers are complete, I bet he'll be walking through the door. So we'll start with um, the seven line prayer of Guru Rinpoche. But before I start, um, can everybody hear me online? If somebody could just um, indicate through chat that they can hear us, that'd be wonderful. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Pama ke sardon pola Yatsin choji nuk drub me Pama jung me she su drop Kor du padra mang po kor Ke ki che su dog drub ki Chin ji lok chu shak su so guru pama siddhi mo. So this is wonderful. Greg has arrived and uh, we'll continue our prayers with praise to Shakyamuni Buddha. Teacher, bow destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, nor of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, bow destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings and go for refuge. Teacher, bow destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, Endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, nor of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, bow destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings and go for refuge. Teacher, bow destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, nor of the world, Helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, Supreme One, Teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, bow destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. When you, chief of humans, were born, you took seven steps on this great earth, and you said, I am supreme in this world. To you who were wise at that time, I prostrate, completely pure body, supremely fine form, Ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, supreme protector, to you I prostrate. Endowed with the supreme marks, a face like the stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you who is free from dust. Matchless one, endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate. Protector, endowed with great compassion, omniscient teacher, field of ocean like merits and good qualities, to the thus gone I prostrate. Your purity, free from attachment, your virtue releases from the evil gone realms, unique, supreme, ultimate meaning, to the Dharma that brings peace I prostrate. From freedom, teaching the path, well abiding in the pure trainings, holy field endowed with good qualities, to the Sangha also I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma refuge, homage to the great Sangha, to all three ever devout homage, to all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms, and all aspects, the supreme faith I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous action, accumulate virtue and goodness, subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, a mirage, a lamp, illusions, drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightning, and clouds, look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this merit, having attained the state of the all-seeing, and thereby subduing the enemy of faults, may I liberate migrators from the ocean of existence, 
stirred by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginning this time and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of Dharma until samsara ends. Through the merit created by myself and others, may the two bodhicittas ripen, and may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. This offering I make of a precious jewel mandala, together with other pure offerings and wealth, and the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. O oh, my masters, my yadams, and the three precious jewels, I offer all to you with unwavering faith, accepting these out of your boundless compassion. Please send forth waves of your blessings. Adam Guru Ratna Mandala Kam Niryati Yami. The Heart of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time. The Bhagavan was dwelling on massive vultures mountain on Rajagriya, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then, through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Shari Putra. Shari Putra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, directly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty. Emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body of mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomenon. There is no eye element, and so on, and up to, and including, no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, and up to, and including, no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequal, 
The mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth, since it is not false. The correction of wisdom is declared. Tayata gate gate par gate par sam gate bodhisoha. We'll say it to ourselves 20 times. Aita gate gate par gate par sam gate bodhisoha. Shariputra, the bodhisattva Mahasattva should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage. It is like that. It is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom, just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagata does rejoice. The Bhagavan having thus spoken, the Venerable Sharivari Putra, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan. <clears throat> well, good morning. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming that's uh, here in person. And uh, there were, there's an accident on highway 99 coming in that's actually pretty bad and one of those that you just don't like to see because it's just obliterated and there's somebody standing on the side of the road with the highway patrol so um people are might be walking in late i walked in just at the top of the hour planning to be here 20 minutes early and so just walking in at the top of the hour um we're gonna start by sitting for six minutes just so that um maybe if others are walking in but before we do um i just want to plant some seeds for those of you who might not be regular practitioners either online or in person that um you know kind of the the purpose of us sitting for the next six minutes and these are some of my favorite quotes and some things that i like to plant as seeds as we might say that we think about before we sit. Um, one of them is dismiss all the thoughts which bother your mind. Train yourself during many days, many months, many years to retain this pure mind. One day, when your empty mind has become crystallized, suddenly it will be illuminated by its own intrinsic wisdom. At that instant, you will realize the state of pure awakening. If that doesn't hit you, Another one of my favorites is, at the core of Buddhist teaching is the awakened mind, the knowing that we are not this body, but consciousness itself, a boundless, luminous, loving, peaceful, intelligent presence. And for those of us who might deal with pain um, regularly, and last one here, third one's a charm, hopefully this will resonate with some of you as well. Healing ourselves is like living, in our, is like living our lives, it is not a preparation for anything else, nor a journey to another situation called wellness. It is its own self. It has its own value. It is each thing as it is. And with that, we'll go ahead and sit for six minutes.
Awesome. Well, thank you for um, sitting with me for a couple of minutes and getting settled. And again, thank you very much for uh, coming to Lion's Roar and Dona Darge, um, our Sangha, our community, where we have the opportunity to come together to share some of our experience. And as Lama always asks us our transparency. And uh, I'm not so much nervous today. Um, maybe a little bit, and, and it's probably only because uh, I'm always authentic and I'm always transparent. And I haven't uh, shared or I haven't done uh, a Dharma talk uh, for a couple of years. And there's some reasons for that. And first and foremost is it's my first Dharma talk is an unmarried man. Um, so as a single person, and getting through that in and of itself and that grief process uh, and being able to be transparent about it and share with the community in the Sangha uh, is important. And to be able to come back and to do that. Part of that, and you know, what I would like to talk about, um, of course, is I could pull out many volumes of Tibetan Pecha texts, and we could go into philosophical conversations on the Golden Light Sutra, which is great right now, um, but Lama doesn't want me to do that. He wants me to um, be an ordinary person, which I am, and just because I like to study the Dharma and maybe have some professional credentials and qualifications uh, that might allow me to do that, I'm just going to share my experience in, in the Dharma, how it's pertained to my life, some of my life experiences, and, and to my journey. Um, but we were talking about prayer wheels last week and kind of having ritual items around the temple. And this is um, a very nice Tibetan prayer wheel. And that I'm very ritualistic. I like rituals. I like mantra. Again, our culture, you can see colors, bright red's my favorite color. It has been since I was born. But this Tibetan prayer wheel um, is nothing more than a purpose of spinning it is to give out an Omani mantra, which is the Omani Pemi Hung mantra um, for loving kindness and compassion for all sentient beings. And within this, um, I could take it apart if, if you want to see it, but inside of this is written in the Uchen script several mantras and sutras and the mantras are embodied within this prayer wheel so that they're spinning millions of times as I'm spinning the prayer wheel right so we're creating fantastic and, and wonderful merit and it's not uncommon to be uh, in any monastery during any teaching and to everybody on the cushions just spinning their wheel the whole time there's a teaching or you know anything's going on or even just walking around town you know people are doing circumambulations of the temple and they're just spinning prayer wheels or you're just doing it at home um it's more about using and then go the other way it's about using your mind and being able to do more than one thing at once being able to talk and spin a prayer wheel or being able to be in meditation and spin a, spin a prayer wheel but um so we could talk about texts and tibetan uh, sutras and tantra all day long. But today we're gonna to talk about something that inspired me based on other Sangha member, Autumn, um, and that was family. And how do we raise our own little Buddha program, right? We have our own little Buddha program within our Sangha that we want to have loving, kind, and compassionate participants. And so as we were having that conversation, we also talked about food scarcity. And so those two things together kind of inspired me to talk about being a foster parent and that part of my life and that journey that I was very grateful, thankful, and blessed to be a part of. And, and it's still a part of my life. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar and, and we'll just kind of talk locally, we'll talk about the state. I wanna give everybody again, a bit of background just to plant some seeds to again, really set the stage for what we're talking about when we talk about a foster child or somebody that's in care uh, in the state of California. There's typically on average between 52 to 53,000 zero to 20 year olds that are in care at any one given time. And they're broken down categorically in four ways. They are placed in a true foster environment, which is a foster family home. 
They can be placed through a group agency or in a group home, which is a residential setting, typically six beds. Um, they can be placed in kinship care, which hopefully is a family member who has resources to be able to provide the needs for the child why the biological parent is unable to do so. Uh, the last one is institutions, and those are typically local county resourced agencies that Sacramento Children's Group Home is a great example. A large facility that has 100 beds, does 24-hour critical care. Um, infants, you know, the foster care system, out of those 55,000, that spectrum of sentient beings between 0 to 18 is dramatic. I didn't come in to this planet uh, saying that I wanted to be a parent. It wasn't something that was inherently on my bucket list, um, so to speak. And I don't know if it's because of being LGBTQ plus, right? If that was part of it, because I know a lot of my friends that are and they wanted to have kids very young and they did go down that path and they have three, four, five kids and they're very happy families and same sex couples and, and that's great. But I, for me, that, that wasn't part of my journey. Um, as I began to have relationships and got a little bit older and then, you know, when I turned 30, it was probably the first time, honestly, that I had ever considered um, being a parent. And of course, I knew that I didn't want to pass on my DNA. There was that if it, if I was going to be a parent, it wasn't to pass on my DNA. That that was not uh, the motivation, as we say in Buddhism, right? Or my uh, altruism for wanting to be a parent. It wasn't to spread my DNA. Uh, my partner, on the other hand, sure said, "Let's you know, look, let's look at the surrogate path." Um, and then let's look at adoption. And then I found out about foster care. And of course, we, we hear about it within the community, um, but it's, it's not a topic that, you know, not everybody's come into contact with even a foster child in the community, uh, as I quickly learned. Uh, and the way that the federal system through the Department of Health and Human Services is set up, along with the level of the state, is that we have an agency that typically makes a decision, right? That creates causes and conditions to remove these children from their parents. And we might think, again, and this is why it's important to have these conversations, we might think that these kids are removed from their parents for simple reasons, like not having enough money, like living in the tent at the end of B Street right there with a five-year-old and their mother and their father, right? Like we might all agree in the room or half might agree in the room. Well, that five-year-old doesn't belong living in the tent down on the street. We should pull that child in, into care, into custody. That's not a reason. Guess what? If you're an alcoholic or a drug addict, that's not a reason. Poverty, alcoholism, addiction, not going to get it to pull your kid. We all know that. Um, and if you don't, you should know that. Because lots of times people want to call and say, well, their mom's an alcoholic. Well, guess what? Lots of people drink. Lots of people have addiction issues. We don't pull kids. The reason I'm honing in on this point so strongly is because there has to be legally um, what we define as substantial neglect abuse or trauma that can be codified in our health and welfare system to say by a judge who's adjudicated it on behalf of the county or on behalf of the people of the state of California to say that we have enough evidence to take a child away. Um, and those are some pretty, they, they're always, always traumatic situations for the child, for the parent, and for anybody that's part of that child's inner circle. 
It's a heartbreaking experience. Um, the type of neglect that we're talking about and some of the attachment that we talk about in Buddhism, right? we talk about attachment a lot, and that causes suffering, right? Because we fall in love with things and we think that we can't live without them and we become attached. Sometimes that doesn't happen with a newborn mother and a newborn child. And that newborn child is left essentially to fend for itself without food, without nurturing, without being attended to when it's crying. And so when a human being isn't nurtured, and isn't touched and isn't cared for from the time they come into this planet. As we know, birth is one of the four sufferings for the mother again and for the child coming into the planet is a painful experience for the mother and for the child. And for a child in their first 365 days on the planet to not have the care and attention and nutrition, again, the food that it needs to thrive. Um, it, it becomes so psychologically harmful to that sentient being, to that infant child, that our fight or flight response fails us in the brain. And the infant develops what's called failure to thrive. And this typically sets in anywhere between 12 to 20 weeks of age. So within the first three to six months of, they're gonna start refusing. By the time CPS gets there, they're going to refuse the bottle because they haven't had it. Child Protective Services, as we call it in California, uh, Department of Family Health, in Texas, it goes by many monikers, but ultimately it's a county agency, not a city agency, but a county agency that has to go in and assess the situation and determine the lack of neglect and care that hasn't been given. And so when CPS does come on scene to a 12 to 15 week old child, who is onset into failure to thrive and has lived off drops of water, and you try to get, you try to give it a bottle, uh, it refuses it, it pushes it away. When you try to pick that baby up for the first time, it pushes you away. Why? Because it's been trying to survive on its own. It's been suffering, and now somebody's there to pick it up and it doesn't want it. It doesn't want the attachment to another person, to another human being, because the harm has already been done. Um, when I did get into foster care, and I did learn about the need within the community, I had some conversations to have with my partner because of course everybody, and it's very common for uh, parents who even aren't able to have babies on their own who want to adopt, to go and do a foster adopt situation, everybody wants an infant. What did I say at the beginning? We have 55,000 kids between the age of zero to 18. 45% of those are over the age of eight. Um, I made the decision that I was going to do what we call diapers to driving <laughs> and that I was going to take any placement. I lived in Yolo County at the time, um, which is not a county model, it, not an agency model. You work directly with the county workers and, and placements versus other foster parents typically might work with a group or a, what we call an agency. And then the agency works with the county. So the foster parent sees a little bit less of what's going on. Sometimes less is better going into that situation um, for the care of the child and the best interest of the child, believe it or not. Um, but diapers to driving was, was really, really important. And 
even though that level of harm and trauma has been done to the child at 12 to 15 weeks old, it's very important to also understand the goal. Again, we all have, you know, the North Star of being a foster parent or of being in kinship care even is reunification. That means that when CPS does come in and take that 12 week old baby, it's gonna be in service or in care for a minimum of six months. Why? Because the judicial cycle, the investigation, the assessments, the tests, all of that, the minimum time frame to really do all of that within the state of California is about six months. So now that baby's gonna be seven and a half months before it's going to get a chance to be in care of the parent if it ever does. Now that scenario that I described to you at the onset is more common than not. It's again substantial neglect, harm, or trauma that requires a child to be pooled and again to have the legal justification to pull a child from a parent. Um, and now what happens essentially is that child goes into a foster home might be a first time foster parent might have experience and they start visitations typically an infant the judge on a first order again judge is only going to see paper they're not going to see anything else except paper judge is just going to say well they're under two years old we want her to see mom three times a week it's going to be a supervised visit and so now the baby's in foster care with a family who's nurturing and loving it and is being forced to be put back into a situation three times a week for at least an hour, which, you know, bundling a newborn baby up and getting it to an office full of fluorescent lights, handing it back to this person who's traumatized it for an hour, leaving the baby with that social worker and the parent is causing more psychological harm. Right? And then you get that baby back in an hour. Attachment and reactive attachment. We have the middle way. We talk nothing in this temple about attachment, right? Because all of us normal humans that have not been traumatized or gone through neglect substantially have attachment of one way. There's a whole nother subset of the population children, children, yet to be adults, who have reactive attachment disorder. That means that they're never going to be able to successfully attach and have a relationship like we do, despite the amount of effort, the amount of work that they put into it. Those are karmic imprints. Those are causes and conditions that were created within our lifetimes. All of us have karmic conditions and karmic imprints that we come into this life with. Some of us never have to have a job and work eight to five, Monday through Friday. That's karma. Right? They're given this opportunity, this lifespan to come in and study the Dharma or again, help other sentient beings and causes and conditions that they create, well, that's one way. Coming into the foster care system at birth, wow. That's a hard, like, that's hard, like, what did they, like, again, that's, what did they do to just, how, what did this little blessed baby, this beautiful blessed baby, how did they get this start? Like, how does that just, it rocks my mind. Uh, and again, it is causes and conditions. And ultimately that's what's happened. And by being a foster parent, we're able to come in and hopefully with Dharmic principles as well, be able to come in and show the other side of that and show what loving kindness is and show what a different path can look like. Not only for the child, but again, as I said, it's about reunification. And if you're in it with the, the right mindset, the right view, the right motivation, you're going to give that biological parent the opportunity to 
get the services, get the help that they need, hopefully some education, um, maybe some financial resources. We can get them food stamps, right? We can get them housing. We can get them education, employment opportunities. There has to be a willingness. And a lot of times there isn't. And so the foster care system, along with legislation, and a lot of national precedents has said, okay, this 12 week old baby, now that we've taken into care, the parents have essentially, like I said, a six month time frame. If we're not seeing, and that may include AA meetings, recovery meetings, right? Again, there's a lot of work has to be done and had, the judge is gonna have to say, yep, they've done the work. We're gonna put this baby back in that situation. Might happen again, and it often does. And it often does, and they get pulled back out yet again. But a zero to two, again, we have assembly bills that have been passed. Um, a baby has a little bit better chance. If the parents aren't doing the work that they need to do, by the age of two, the goal of, again, Health and Human Services at a national and federal level is that it's in the best interest of that child that they be in a permanent placement by 24 months. So that means that that child needs to be adopted and in a permanent placement as if it's going to live the rest of its you know life with that family so they lose chances a little bit more with infants and it's really become one of those areas of legislation that becomes contestable and debatable um, but because the nature of the psyche the mindset right and the fragility of an infant scientifically and psychologically we know the sooner that we do have that intervention for that infant, we're gonna see market success. And so if we do get a failure to thrive baby at three months old, 70% will turn around. There will be substantial developmental, physical, and psychological delays with the child. Immediately, again, just because of the nature of the first 12 months of their life and being so dramatically set back really sets up some challenges and some obstacles for the future. Um, and so the zero to two population really gets adopted. And, and again, there's not always families that are willing to adopt, um, but that, that's the plan. The older children are a little bit harder. Um, one of my placements, I took him in in his freshman year of high school. He was 14. And I just had dinner with him three weeks ago. He just turned 25 years old. And, uh, he's still local. He's doing great. And he had been in foster care since he was seven years old. And literally every six to nine months, would go home and would last for three months and then he would be back in care um, in multiple states and again that case is not uncommon for children that do end up in foster care to be stuck in the system throughout the majority of their childhood we talked about the spectrum of the infant i want to talk a, a, a bit for the spectrum of that 18 year old. This is where, again, Bodhicitta and Assembly Bill 12 and social activism, again, one of my favorite areas, um, were able to create causes and conditions. So typically in the state of California, when you turn 18, regardless if you're still in high school or where you're at, if you're a foster child, you were given a black garbage bag on your 18th birthday. And the expectation was that you would put your personal belongings in this black garbage bag 
and that you would be out the door. Why? Because the state's no longer willing to support an 18-year-old that's in foster care. Now, this has been precedence since foster care. When I came into the foster care system, um, I learned about this and also with our foster and kinship care educator at a Woodland Community College, who's done foster care and kinship care for 40 years now. They were working on legislation and we had the opportunity to go in front of state assembly and to discuss Assembly Bill 12. And Assembly Bill 12 essentially changed state law. It, it, it changed the code to say, okay, foster children can stay in care until they're now 21 years old instead of 18. And the reason for that is because 70% of foster care youth were ending up homeless and pregnant and addicted to drugs, if not dead within a very short amount of time because they did not have the foundational skills to be able to go into transition successfully into society at 18 when bouncing around and bouncing around and bouncing around. So consequently, now in California, we have that spectrum that we've really been able to fill and the statistics and the data show it, right? They're able to now remain in that same home as a foster child all the way through their junior or senior year of college. That change in and of itself, the effect that it's gonna have on the foster care system will yield for generations, will yield for generations. Um, it's one of those journeys as a foster parent, unfortunately, that it will get your heart and rip it out and um, unfortunately as you know the judge and the law doesn't always agree with what the foster parent or even the social worker determines is the best interest of the child and so sometimes it's really hard you know you're sending a child who's become adjusted back into a situation where they're deemed for failure and to have to watch it cataclysmically unfold before your very eyes, I guarantee you will rip your heart out each and every day when you have to witness it firsthand or see cases like it. Um, I had an infant, my one and only infant, and my last foster placement, as a matter of fact. He just turned 12. Uh, he was born 7-11-11, uh, uh, the week before my birthday is, is his birthday, so he's a uh, he's pretty lucky little baby there. And um, very close story, I actually, so I've had 13 placements as a foster parent. I could talk for days, weeks, and months about all of their experiences and their journey. Uh, a couple of my first placements were a pair of uh, half-brothers. They shared the same mom. They were seven and 16. And this infant that I took into placement was their older sister's baby. So uh, I had the, again, privilege of getting up every two to four hours, working 60 hours a week uh, for the first year and having a crib in my room right next to my bed and getting up and changing a diaper and feeding four to six ounces and putting a baby back down, getting up and going to work and seeing what it's like for my team at work, who I see every day all around me raising babies, right? Um, and people say, well, I didn't sleep last night. You know, I was up with the baby. And it's like, well, I could never relate to that. There's just things like in Buddhism, you don't know what you don't know until you know it or until you've done it or until you've had the realization or experience in and of itself. Um, so raising an infant, I think you, there's that, you know, it, they don't do a whole lot, but there's a bond that develops. Uh, and again, that bond that developed uh, was 
something that I thought, okay, the, and Julian was the, the first one that I ever thought I was going to possibly adopt. And again, but that's not ever the goal in foster care. You need to reunify the baby or at least give the parent a, an opportunity. And he ended up reunifying and uh, not back with his mom, but actually back with his dad, which is why I was kind of upset with and not such a good situation. And after that, it, uh, it, it, it took a piece of my heart that again, grief is one of the things that uh, samsara, right? It's part of our human existence. We're all going to experience loss and grief in all aspects of our lives, whether it's being a biological parent, being a foster parent, being a husband, a wife, a sister, a brother, a mother, a father, a friend, um, there's always going to be loss or detachment that's happening. And that's happening constantly because of our philosophical principle of impermanence. Everything is always changing. Uh, and the, as much as I wanted to have, you know, maybe raised him until he was 18, that wasn't the path. Um, my partner that I did was in foster care with uh, when I had the teenager, we also had two infants with us and he ended up adopting them out of foster care and his, their biological parents had another child and that was immediately pulled at the hospital and given to him. Uh, this happens a lot up to seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 children. A lot of times they don't leave the hospital at that point. They're pulled into care immediately, but Again, there's sometimes very good outcomes, sometimes not so good. There's always that middle way, right? There's always has to be that middle way. But I think as a foster parent, if anybody is looking for the opportunity to help the community, being a foster parent doesn't mean that they're gonna be there for 18 years. It means that they could be there for 24 hours, just why the police pull them out, get them to your house, get them a warm meal, some fresh clothes to find out where they are gonna go, right? Um, we have a lot, of, a lot of seniors, believe it or not, in Yolo County, um, in Davis, took nothing but emergency placements, which means you get a call at 2.45 in the morning and say, we need to meet you know, West Sac PD, down at the county so that we can hand over this 12 year old 13 year old boy girl every i mean it's every race every population the foster it's there's no discrimination when it comes to trauma and neglect and how human beings treat each other and how sentient beings we relate with one another um it, it really was a life-changing experience to be a foster parent. And again, maybe something in, in the future that I've been open to now that I've been away from it so long, I terminated my license after, um, that was my last infant, and then after my last teenager, I was pretty much done. So not that I wouldn't do it again, it takes a lot, it takes a whole lot, but, I still stay in touch with them. And that's the beautiful part is that the ones that I was able to have that relationship with, I was able to see graduate with a 4.0 from high school. I'm going to his wedding actually, and they're having it, but one of them is turning 28. They're, he's, they're getting married. His fiance is a nurse. They're having their first baby. I mean, these were the outcomes that I was able to participate in and continue to have a continuity of relationship and to help support them along their journey and to always be, you know, available, whatever I, whatever capacity they need to, to talk to, to listen to, support, whatever. Um, that was the really cool part about being a foster parent. And, and again, I think what everybody can benefit from. So I'm going to stop there because we have some time. I would love to have a discussion, answer any questions. I can go into depth or detail on any more subject. I know that was a lot, um, but it definitely relates to the Dharma and Buddhism and all of our principles, especially um, impermanence, attachment, and afflictive emotions.
So thank you all very much again for coming today and especially everybody online too. Yeah, do we need an answer? Yeah. Yeah. I thank you for your talk. Yeah. Um, you talk about like ripening of karma. Mm -hmm. You tell me uh, um, what uh, growing up as uh, you know a young child, uh, you know what, you know what got you, you know. Um, Thinking about other sentient beings and, and being a foster parent. Is there any, you know? Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. That's a great question. Um, so, I, what got me thinking about other sentient beings? I, I think probably when I was about fourteen years old was one of the first times. And I was, you know, for people who don't know, again, I was born and raised Catholic. So, um, when I was fourteen, though, is when I had to really find out who I was as a person. And I saw others who were struggling to find out who they were as individuals. And I started working with others and started a club at school, uh, the first LGBTQ club at a high school in the state of California back in the 90s, as a matter of fact, and always kind of wanted to work with others and liked dealing with other people. I've always been drawn to people. Um, especially to situations of suffering. That's all I do at work is solve problems and um, deal with issues, whether they're you know personal, technical, or all of the above. I think it's just one of the things that Buddhism, it's, it's one of the root philosophical reasons of our spiritual practice is, is to be able to connect with others meaningfully and to relieve other suffering. And the only way to be able to do that is to be able to come into contact with people. Um, and in our Sangha, we have a, you know, a very focused group of people who study the Dharma, but being out in the community in other ways is even more meaningful because you can apply Dharma principles and people don't even know that you're applying Dharma principles, right? So yeah, does that help? Does that help? Cool. Thanks. Thanks. I see people online too. Right, Andrew, is Andrew gonna? We're trying to come hey there. On. Yeah, yeah. I want to say something. Um, so I was really um, heartened to hear about this assembly bill. I didn't know about it um, back in the late '90s. I worked as a counselor in an emancipation program for uh, teenagers in a group home. And my job was to get them independently functioning, to go from being, you know, having everything done for them around them to do this on your own. Yeah. My big success, really my only success, was getting a kid a job at Taco Bell in an apartment. Fingers crossed. That was like the best I did. And um, the hopelessness that I felt in that job was, was just palpable. Um, you really felt like you were throwing these kids to the wolves. Um, and so, you know, I, I am hoping that extra three years does something to really help. I'm sure it does. But, um, you know, just kind of bringing this back to a Buddhist perspective. I mean, I, I, ha I have to think that being a Bodhisattva, there's some personality trait that makes you want to benefit others. Maybe even before you became Buddhist or a Bodhisattva. Mm -hmm. um, and there's that good feeling that comes from benefiting others, which is a lot of why people like to do it. But when you're attempting to benefit others, and it feels like you're not doing anything. You just watch them get worse. Um, that's a hard feeling, right? So I'm wondering, as you dealt with that, how have you used your practice? Yeah, that's an awesome question, Andrew. Thank you. Um, and I will tell you the answer to that, how, do, how I deal with that. Um, I 
study Buddhism a lot, and we'll, we'll be, might be surprised to some of you, but uh, I study Buddhism a lot. Uh, I spent the morning, this morning, with, Ges, uh, with Geshe Tashe Searing, who is the abbot at Sarah J. And we, he held, he held the meeting this morning. We hadn't met in a couple months, and there's about 50 of us globally that meet. And it was the first time I had ever seen this type of talk from him, and it was called Dealing with Difficult or Unusual Circumstances. And ultimately, what it came down to this morning was probably the most authentic and emotional, and it's probably recorded. So if you're interested in seeing it, I'll see if I can get it from his admins. But he was purely and rawly emotional this morning. And for that very reason that you said, because as an abbot of a monastery sitting on a cushion, watching the conditions of the world happening as they are very much to the situation that you're describing and I'm describing, what is it, how is it that we can continue to be a bodhisattva and what causes and conditions can we even affect that are going to give us that relief or that feeling, like you said, that, that sense of helping others, that kind of sense of relief of helping others or seeing that effort come to fruition, manifesting that bodhicitta effort, right? It's very difficult to do. Um, and he even said, it's nothing more than dealing with our afflictive emotions. He described even, you know, seeing global leaders on the screen and having feelings of anger arise within him. And this is a Harampa Geshala talking to me or talking to a group about anger from seeing news events on the screen when I'm going to the meeting to hear from him about why I'm angry for seeing world leaders on the news screen. Um, and he said he has to answer this often, and it really does come down to understanding that we need to continue to develop more bodhicitta, right? There, there's compassion missing, and he broke it down to the human realm, so much to say that if, for example, he used, he, he used the example of when the situation started, you know, 75 days ago, most countries, including us, were sending as much support as quickly as possible to help the people that were being attacked. And how as a Buddhist are we <laughs> okay with saying yeah send this artillery off so that they can save themselves versus why is this even happening in the first place like why are they even under attack but as a buddhist for us to naturally come out we're defending the people that are under attack and to Geshe, uh, Kangsha Rinpoche also ha has spoken extensively about this, that suffering that we're feeling from uh, not being effective here, really, we need to come to loving kindness and compassion for both sides and sitting deeply in meditation to realize that we need to eliminate those, again, the three poisons, right? Those three poisons are perfect prime time to work on them with real-time life dharma activities that are happening that we're seeing. So that's how I deal with being ineffective um, or not feeling a sense of effectiveness in helping others is just, first of all, going to the gurus <laughs> and saying, where's my practice or where's my view not right where you know six paramitas are here everything like which wheel do i need to be turning because i'm feeling the same way that you are most of the time it's very ineffective 
with what's happening. He also said we, uh, you know, need to participate in a way that we can. Of course, us sitting here comfortably on our cushion doing mantra, and that work is going to help. Yes, but can we send toilet paper? Can we send napkins? And yes, he listed these items exclusively. Um, drinking straws to these suffering countries doesn't cost a lot of money. It's $15, right? Whatever little participatory action that we can do is another way to try to alleviate that. Um, for me, that doesn't mean that I'm going to go and be a foster parent again right now. It means I can continue to watch and again, from a society perspective, contribute with legislation through activism. And also, like you said, I can advocate now. There's other wonderful organization, CASA. Uh, my mom was a uh, victim advocate, right? There's a lot of advocacy that can be done uh, even for the refugees, for foster children that I think can be meaningful, but it's a constant like pulling for straws to say what effort are we going to pull out that's going to have the most impact and, and that's always a struggle I think does that make sense does that help yeah yeah for sure um you know I I know I don't know if you felt any sense of guilt when you stopped being a foster parent like um letting go of trying to fill a need I think um you know, that's a common affliction of people that try to help others is um, when you feel the need to scale back, you feel guilty. Um, and so I guess I'll just put out, I'm reminded of Lama's, one of his favorite quotes is only give 49%. Uh. Uh, <laughs> so I think that's um, checking in with yourself when you're spent, uh, when you've gotten depleted on a certain uh, area, certain uh, passion projects. Um, there's plenty to go around. So uh, better that you that you continue to have energy um, and know how to use it. It is. And I think you're right. Um, no, I did not. I do know of others that have had guilt. And yes, people that suffer through guilt. I did not have guilt when I made the concrete decision to stop being a foster parent. And the reason why is because I clearly examined my motivation and intention and my inspiration for not wanting to be a foster parent anymore. And I was able to take away from that that I will be able to help more sentient beings in other ways, perhaps more meaningful by doing different types of work than by actually taking on placements myself. Um, there's always more to be done. And Lama will always say that there's always more that we'll need to study, that we will need to do. And so I think looking at it at a um, macro level practice rather than the micro level practice that I was in, if that makes sense to you. That's how I was able to justify that I was shifting my energy and efforts to a macro level practice rather than the micro level. Yeah, makes sense. The babies in the stream analogy. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Did we have, Thank I you. think we had a chat question. That was a moving talk. Okay, thank you, JD. That was a moving talk. Awesome. Okay. And it looks like we have a question from Dylan. He says, how would you suggest to help ex foster youth or current foster youth that are placed in homes where the foster parents are doing it for the money and are still in the cycle of neglect that happened in the home they were taken out of? Some foster parents will paint a pretty picture when the social workers come out and instill fear within their foster youth to not speak out about the neglect. And um, I'm getting chills and goosebumps, Dylan. And I don't know, Dylan, do you know Dylan? Is, is he come here? Okay. Um, well, first of all, that question, um, it gave me goosebumps because I didn't talk about that side of the coin. And Dylan is talking about reality. 
And as Buddhists and everybody in this room will understand the ultimate reality here. And I'll take a breath and a sip here and I'll give you the reality. Because I need to be very scientific and psychological. There is a subset of the foster parent population. And I talked about this um, early on in my talk. There's four types of placements. There's direct placement through the county, which I was. I dealt nothing but the county worker, the attorney, and the judge. Dylan is talking likely about a situation where Lily put is an agency here in Sacramento that you would go into as a couple and say, yes, we want to be foster parents, and they would give you the glam. I love that word glam. They would give you the shiny, beautiful aspect of it. At the same time, um, there's remuneration. Um, there is a stipend that's provided to the foster parents. That stipend is for the child. The situation that Dylan is referring to is, and again, this is not anything taboo or secret. The judges that sit in every single county know this. There are couples that sign up to be foster parents just to have that as a primary source of income. So when they're looking at taking placements as a source of income, we discussed the motivation, our intentions for being a foster parent is to nurture and care for the child. Sometimes the motivation and intention is not to nurture and care for the child, it's to provide income for the caregivers and not for the children. And so the caregivers are able to Usually, these scenarios are manifested with teachers very quickly because these foster care children are still not given the standard or level of care that they deserve. They're still not, they're not wearing new Nikes, they're not wearing new Levi's. Um, they're being rationed food. They're being told they can only eat three times a day by their foster parents, and they can only eat what WIC provides them. They're not able to have their, their foster parents not going to take them to fast food. Their foster parents not going to take them to the Sacramento Zoo. Their foster parents not going to take them on vacation. Their foster parent is going to provide, as he said, the bare level of care to produce the facade for the social worker to allow them to remain as caregivers with the minimum standard of care that the state of California requires. That's what Dylan's talking about. So how do I help ex foster youth or current foster youth? I like to get in touch with them. I like to see their placement. And then I usually have a conversation with that foster parent. And if that's unsuccessful, I ask to have them put into a placement that's suitable and is an environment which they're more comfortable and which they're going to thrive in. Um, and that doesn't always happen. And the reason that doesn't always happen, number one reason that doesn't always happen is because we do not have enough foster parent homes. And that Dan was talking about that, right? We, we, won't, we don't have enough firefighters for the city of Sacramento. We, we're, there's resource needs everywhere, right? So it's not just, again, but this is a, a very typical flip side of the coin situation, as I would say, that people who have become foster parents, and, and it is known. And, and to, I've met foster youth, um, many who grew up in the system who said, yeah, I was raised by two people who did it because they got a paycheck every month. And to have to live in an environment like that? I mean, sure, it, it's a standard basic level of care, but where's the loving kindness? Where's the compassion? Where's the empathy? Where are the human emotion 
thoughts and feelings that should be reciprocated when you're interacting with a sentient being who you made a choice to bring into your home to provide and care for. And to be able to put up boundaries and walls like that with care restrictions or level of care, it, it really blows my mind. But unfortunately, um, it is reality in the, in the system. Um, and a lot of time, the social workers, the judges, and, and the multi-agency resources that do support the foster youth, they do know, and I, it wouldn't take anybody in this room 30 seconds to Google foster parent abuse, and there's thousands of cases in our country that are opened every single year of, again, kids that have came into care that have been yet further abused, harmed, and neglected. I don't want to go negative on the talk, but it, again, it, it, it's a very real situation, and, and foster care is one of those things that um, I could get. My next Dharma talk could be on adult protective services and on the elderly and what happens in America to our senior population versus to every other Asian country or European country in the world where we take care of them for generations and they're putting their parents away and taking all their money and never, I mean, so it's a problem across society. The message is we all are 7 billion sentient beings. We all need to have empathy, loving kindness, compassion, care, patience, and tolerance for each other each and every day. Um, and if we can all try and participate in one small way, as Geshe Tashi said this morning, um, whatever that is, then we need to do that. So, um, Dylan, thank you for that uh, difficult uh, picture. But um, yeah, thanks for, I think it's really important that people did hear the side of that scenario too, because it's really real. It's really, really real. So thanks for bringing that up. Anybody in the room? Autumn? Well, Andrew took my question. Oh, okay, cool. So I'm just gonna say uh, thank you for the talk. It's really, uh, you know, uh, some difficult things to hear, but important that we're all aware of. Um, and, you know, I, I find it difficult to imagine how we can develop that bond and then let them go back into a negative situation and i i don't know if i personally could actually do that but maybe we're capable of doing more than we can like can you talk a little bit more yeah, about that? yeah of course um yes and i will not get emotional let's say that way so my mom um who's here in the room and, and it's okay to get emotional yeah um you're safe <laughs> so when when they come in when when they come into care we you know that there's that six month window right so as we're getting closer to that six months even i want to say like we'll have a four week hearing right before that six month elapses so we'll know going into that hearing which way are we going here like is he going home like is that even a possibility first of all is that even a possibility? Sometimes it's not going to happen. Like we're just going to have to go to the six month, the 12 month, the two six hearing, which is an 18, the two six hearing is where we terminate parental rights. Um, it depends on the placement. So if we know, goal being reunification, you should know that when you take the placement that they're going to be going home. So if you're planting that seed, you're bringing this child in to show them your life and how you raise your kids and to give them the opportunity just to live that golden lifestyle for one week, two weeks, three weeks could change their life forever, right? So even if you know that they're coming in, but they are going to leave, if you start with that mindset, it's a little bit easier. Sometimes they come into care and they're like, nope, he's going to stay. There's no way the mom's going to get him back, right? She's 23. She's bipolar. She's dual addicted, right? This is her fourth child. She's three others have been adopted out. You kind of know. Hmm. And the social workers know. Hmm. 
this placement's probably going to go into a foster adopt, or we're going to we're going to be moving towards a two six hearing. We're going to be moving within a year to terminating parental rights, and once that happens, we adopt within a year. So you really need to set your psychological mindset um, going into the placement each and every time, and ask as many questions. And a lot of times, you're not going to get any answers. They don't have to tell you anything. That's why I didn't work with uh, an agency. I work directly with the counter, the, the uh, county agency, the county social workers is because it's from, I don't want to play telephone, right? I don't want to play telephone. I want to be working directly with their immediate support system. So we're all aligned and on the same page. Not every county is able to operate like that. I get it. The SAC County is an agency model. Yolo County is not, Placer County is not, um, but some are. I didn't know. I, I think when I did get heartbroken, I didn't know. I, it was a placement where I didn't know what was going to happen. Um, there was a little girl, uh, my mom um, fell, kind of fell in love, that um, very extreme, unusual circumstance. She was actually um, a child of somebody who was a social worker. She was in that family system, and so they automatically thought she was going to be right foster adopted and within three weeks she was completely reversed and gone right so you still never really know and of course it's like life like i didn't know there was going to be a catastrophic accident this morning or else i would have left you know an hour and 15 minutes instead of just an hour ahead but when it does come i break it down to again, my Buddhist practice and deeply understanding my afflictive emotions that I'm experiencing grief because I've developed an attachment to the soul, to the sentient being. And I also have to tell myself that the time that we did have together, back to that it was the most meaningful and hopefully a life-changing experience for them karmically that we were able to at least meet and if they do go back that they've always got a fallback or somewhere you know somewhere to come back to um, because that's always an option when they do is that if it doesn't work out they're right back here right and you're having those conversations with them if they are going home like we're gonna be we're in the same town right you still go to the same school with my kids so we're still gonna see you even if you do go home so it's not that kind of dramatic but um, sometimes it is they get the baby back and they move out of state so that they're out of that they're out of the services they're out of scope and they're not going to be looked at uh, further ultimately it's afflictive emotions it's grief and dealing with grief and I've had it hit me I think more which is why I haven't done any sharing or talking um, in the last two years is because uh, I have had more curveballs thrown like i never expected that i would be divorced like that just was not in the cards like when i got my i got engaged right and then got married as a buddhist right so it's very difficult and of course everything's impermanent but we still don't think that well that's not going to happen to me <laughs> well, of course it does so hey um it does and that's where i think i have to go when I do deal with that afflictive emotion, I have to go deal with understanding the positivity that, as Lama says, what's coming out of that, Greg? Well, resiliency is coming out of that. Well, patience is coming out of that. Uh, real experience, Greg, that you can go tell the Sangha, this is how you apply the Dharma to that real life experience, right? Um, so those are the things that I have to try to just kind of move forward. Um, otherwise, it, it can be because I and of course I still think well what if you know what would my life be like now if I still had him he'd be 12 years old now what would you know he'd be going into seventh grade right what would his grades be like what do you look like that still but you know so of course I think about those things but I still think about those things with my ex-husband I still think about those things about my grandmother I wish she was sitting here today right I thought about her the whole way here today um there hasn't been a, it's going to be three if it's three years and it feels like three weeks or three days sometimes I can't get my head clear. So it just, I think it depends on the things. And, um, you know, like Daniel was saying, I think we know where we, it's time we back off and say we're not really most effective there anymore. And we shift focus and shift energy to areas where we are able to manifest.
addressed, like food scarcity. Like, again, that's a really area that I'm hot topic about, right? And Susan is, she's always has been since I've been a member of the Sangha. Like, these are things that fundamental that we can touch every spectrum in the community and it helps everybody everywhere. So I try to take the granularity, the self and the ego out of any of it. And I just want to do the right thing for the people that I do get to come into contact with the other sentient beings that I do get to have a heart connection with. So, yeah. Yeah. We're when you first began bringing foster care children into your home, were you Buddhist already at that point? Yes, yes, I had been. That for was like the cornerstone of yeah, handling all those. Yeah, for probably a good 10, about a good 10 years at that point, yes. But honestly, the biggest thing to me becoming the foster parent was just uh, maturity, it was just age. Like before the age of 30, there was no way I could have ever thought about like that. I was an only child. Well, not I have. A, I mean, I have a sister, but I was raised as an only child uh, until I was eleven, and then she was born. But then uh, we didn't even live together all of the time. So I was always by myself. It wasn't. Um, I had to be ready to like care for somebody else because. I've never like I can't do that I would travel I work I mean it was just there's there's no way like how am I going to work and deal with the baby yeah how am I going to get up in the middle of the night um but those were some of the best experiences that I had you know um and I look back and it was hard and I looked like hell half the time you know my clothes my hair whatever but um I was bonding with that baby and just to, you know and I had to learn things like well Greg don't turn on the lights at 2 30 in the morning because he's up and smiling at you and wants to play just keep the lights off change the diaper don't even look at him just change the diaper and beat him and he's gonna go and lay him back down or I used to lay back down with him and that was you know the worst because he just fall back to sleep but that's a bad behavior they said no just put him back down and let him go back to sleep on his own so there's all of these these little details that you just learn but um and and I enjoyed it at the time and there are experiences that you just kind of have to have even as a you know a dharmic practice as much as I want to be in the monastery I'm not going to have that experience in the monastery um but if I can still learn the dharma and try and apply that dharma and share it with others I guess I don't know it's just different right I still think there's just things we all have Anybody else online? Cool. We're right at time to do closing prayers, I guess. Um, I did two books because everybody, just in case, because I always love books, as everybody knows. Um, the first one is called Parenting Her Child. And again, comes really from uh, an abuse and trauma neglect perspective. And just to give you some insights into some more personal stories and perspectives and how they overcome some of those challenges and obstacles and then the second one is called the hurried child and this is uh growing up too fast too soon and this is really applicable to placements that unfortunately have been in and out of foster care since they were two three and are now 15 16 as teenagers and have become very hard right to even make just a simple connection with to sit down and have you know make eye contact with or have a cup of coffee with or be able to, to hold hands or give a hug to right without an uh an unexpected reaction that we might not be used to so they're just there's so much that goes into to caring for traumatized children which is um, yeah but yeah so two books to share sorry and then i meant to share those books earlier because there's always resources and i have plenty of resources if anybody's interested in becoming a foster parent or has questions or wants to know just let me know cool thank you again everybody for coming osakadawa june 12th big day so osakadawa is on june 12th and i'm the point person for this celebration if anyone wants to volunteer their time on the day of or uh, mm -hmm. food even you know like it's a day before <laughs> yeah just uh talk to me there's sign up yeah. sheets like patty wanted in the back they're working on yeah. it okay okay
Thank you so much, Greg. So um, we'll do dedication. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good, all powerful Chimrizik Tenzin Gyatso. Please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always imperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of optimist compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras, Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages, Losang Jagpa, I make requests at your holy feet.